I stand here today representing myself as well as the South African Energy Storage Association. Uh, you would have noted from many of the speakers that storage is the next best thing. And I just want to remind you that, that, that in order to store, you need a surplus. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm also speaking in, in the case, the, the speaker who was meant to be speaking in this position was from the ESCOM systems operator and he was unable to come. So I'm speaking from a system operating perspective, uh, not representing ESCOM, but if any of you attended any of my RP meetings previously or nurse hearings on tariff adjustments, you will remember that on the last tariff adjustment meeting, I spoke on behalf of ESCOM and I apologize to the country on behalf of ESCOM, although I wasn't commissioned by ESCOM, but that's another story. <coughs> So this is our hourly load in South Africa. We've seen, we've seen this, this is for a whole year and it's quite interesting. I've put in some numbers there, minimum load, base load, average, maximum and, and maximum summer load. Uh, the base load that we speak about is not actually the minimum load. The minimum happens on Christmas day normally. So if you look at that, it's round about the end of the year when we hit an absolute minimum. The so-called base load I like to define as the minimum amount we need during working weeks. So it's the highest of the profs, if that makes sense. And that's the kind of number we need. And it's quite nice to plot this as a thing called a cumulative frequency curve. And if you look at that curve, you'll see for about 80% of the time, we need about 23 and a half megawatts in South Africa, or rather gigawatts for about 80% of the time. And if you take away Sundays, public holidays, and the week between Christmas and New Year, you can check it on your cell phone calculators. You end up with 80% of the time. So 80% of the time we need about 20, um, uh, 23 and a half uh, gigawatts. If we, if we take the, that whole year's data and, and, and just take a couple of months, that's what it looks like. And the numbers I've put in there are not the minimum, the base for this data set, it's for the whole year, just as a reference point. And you can see the big difference here is not actually the peaks during the daytime. The big difference here is the difference between day and night. That's where we have our big ramping difficulty, so to speak. We have to go from very low at night to very high in the daytime. And then during the daytime, if we look at a curve like this, which just shows a week again, Thanks uh, for showing that in advance. Everyone knows what it is now. It shows that on a, on a week basis, um, uh, we, we do have these peaks during the daytime, but the big, the big difference is the diurnal peak between evening and, and daytime. Now, as a system operator, I want you to imagine running a current account. I don't know, I, I was going to say a check account, but I don't think anyone does that anymore. Imagine running a current account, and you're not allowed to have an overdraft, which is pretty much my situation at the moment, but we needn't go there. <laughs> you're not allowed to have an overdraft, that's fine, you can kind of manage, but now imagine running a current account where you're not allowed to have a credit balance either. So you've got this account, you're not allowed to have an overdraft, and you're not allowed to have a credit balance, but you've got to transact. Well, that's the balancing act that the system operator has to do every day. He's got to balance supply and demand <coughs> almost exactly. He's got a little bit of wriggle room, which is basically his bank charges. In my case, it's not a little bit of wriggle room. It's the most expensive charge. So imagine doing that. So how do you do that? So you've got to transact. So you go to your shop and you're about to buy your groceries. And you've got to line it up. As they charge you, you've got to have a, a grey bag with cash in it and you can go there either. And as the thing happens, you've got to do the switch just to get it in time. And that's how you've got to transact. So the life of electricity, it's got to balance exactly. It's storage or the ability to store in the actual system before we talk about storage is worse than sushi. It's got a much shorter life storage spanning it's got to happen transactionally almost immediately so how does the system operate many how does he manage this and the answer is he's got resources at his disposal he's able to cause the demand to reduce 
You can go to the sector and say, we all know what load shedding is. That's a dramatic form of reducing demand. He also luckily has some storage in the form of pump storage. And pump storage basically gives him a bit of overdraft. It allows him to be able to operate above and below this ridiculous balancing threshold. Sorry, my, I thought I'd stress this off. It seems to have come on now. Uh, oh, no, sorry. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's what happens if he doesn't get the balancing right. He's got to resort to, he's got to, resort to load shedding. There goes my phone again. Sorry. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Doran from AES. Uh, I'm filing out this registration form for my 40 megawatt battery storage project. I just want to be clear that I should fill out this form as a, as a generator. Where's, where's the RP chat? Hi, Dorian. Yes, if you're supplying power to the grid, you will need to complete the resource asset registration form, or as we call it, the RARF. Uh, okay, but what about when I'm charging from the grid? Um, will, you be control will we be controlling your battery while it's charging? That, yeah, that's what the system is specifically designed to do. It's designed to serve the market. Okay, sir. You'll need to fill out another form. And this is for your controllable load resource. Essentially, the load <coughs> RAFR. Two forms? I don't like forms. For one facility? How many megawatts should I put on each form? If you can charge and discharge at the 40 megawatts you mentioned, you will need to put 40 megawatts on each form. So that means this is an 80 megawatts of resource? Are you sure this is correct? This is how the model works in the system. It's two 40 watt megawatt resources to us. Supply and load, sir. Supply and load. Cool. Thanks very much. There we go. Thank you. Cheers. Sorry, I just had to take that. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so that's what we look like at the moment. That's our load profile, which I don't have to explain now, thanks to Stefan, or is it Stefan? Um, and what I've brought at the bottom there is basically what he also showed us, the residual load. I've subtracted all of that load away from the demand, but I've chosen to show storage in and storage out and gas. So the bottom graph is taking away all of the generation from the demand graph and showing what's left over. And that's where we sit at the moment. If we lose Kohora Bassa and our diesel generators because we don't have enough diesel, that's what it looks like if we, if we lose that. And, and you can see at the bottom now that deep orange color is what? It's load shedding. That shows you how, how, how desperately tight our system is. So I want to go back to saying we haven't lost our, pump, our, 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 our hydro from Kohora Bassa. And we've still got our gas available, our gas turbines, good old gas turbines, and there we are. But what I want you to do now is close your eyes, well you don't have to, and imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning and the coal fleet's gone. It's gone completely, but we've kept everything else. The little bit of nuclear, is the red at the bottom, we've got some wind and solar, we've still got Kohora Bassa, but we've lost our coal fleet. You'll see at the bottom now, it's showing that we've got lots of load shedding. Um, because that's showing the residual. And the little bit at the top there is what we still haven't, we've got other than our coal fleet. So that shows you that the coal fleet basically currently produces what the orange is there. So let's replace it with a brand new coal fleet. We go out and we build a brand new coal fleet. And I want to be very specific here. We build a coal fleet that works. <laughs> I used to say a Toyota Corolla coal fleet, but after an unfortunate incident, I can no longer say that. So it's a coal fleet that works. That's what it would cost us one per, per kilowatt hour. If we, if we replace the current coal fleet with a brand new coal fleet, that's the cost of producing. ESCOM would have to sell at a higher price than that because of transmission and other things. But that's an all-in cost of production, <coughs> but not delivery. So it's like the pizza before it's been delivered to you. If we replaced it with nuclear, so we took that coal fleet and we said, let's 
wake up tomorrow morning to a nice big new nuclear fleet to replace that. That's what it would cost us, and that's what it would look like. And you'll see I've still got the thing at the bottom showing storage in, storage out. That's the cost. What would happen if we tried to do it with solar? So I've just jacked up the solar now, and I've done it where I haven't allowed it to exceed the demand curve. So there's no spare solar. So you'll see there's no storage reflecting on the bottom. You can only store when you've got an excess. That's why I don't store. But you, you can only store with an excess. You'll see that the solar, some people say solar, the sun shines at the wrong time. Well, in my book, it shines at the right time because that's when the system needs the electricity the most. The peaks in the daytime, sure, they're important, but boy, the sun shines at the right time. It's when we use most of our electricity. What about if we did wind? So if we just did wind and sort of did it so that we never exceeded the demand, you can see there's a couple of points at the bottom there where, where the wind is making up the whole required demand. That's what it looks like. What about if we just use gas? We said we're not going to do any more wind and solar, we're just going to flood the thing with gas. Wartzilla, internal combustion, gas engines, lots of them. That's about what it would cost. And it's that cheap because it's, 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 it's gas turbines or gas internal combustion engines running on gas. It's kind of revolutionary, I know. <laughs> but, it's, but it's basically a gas infrastructure running on gas. And that's what it would cost if we did it at that scale. So it seems like a reasonable alternative. What about if we slipped in a bit of wind and solar and said, well, let's make up the balance with gas. Well, that's what it would cost, more or less. Remember, production cost. So what would happen then if we said, no, wait a bit. Let's go the whole hog and put in lots of wind and solar with lots of excess. And that graph now, the brown bits there are solar and it's surplus. So when it's brown, it's going into storage. When it's yellow, above the red line, it means it's surplus. Your storage was full, but the sun was still shining, so you had a bit extra. So let's make some hydrogen. Let's use it for electrolysis and make some hydrogen. Notice I've said gas. I haven't said natural gas or any kind. I'm, I, I could be talking about hydrogen, for example, when I talk about gas. Okay, so we've got that model. The green is coming out of storage. So I've got a whole lot of storage. And I've costed that storage. And that's what it costs, 94 cents. I think those probably gel reasonably well with the figures we saw from, from, from Stefan's presentation. So what we need to, to, to recognize from this as well is that where's our base, base load on this diagram? Remember those graphs, the first one? If we drew a black line at the bottom of those curves, tell me what would be constituting, what would be making up that so-called base load? Look at that graph and tell me what the base load is made up of. Well, it's a bit of nuclear at the bottom. We've still got uh, Kahora Bassa. We've got wind and solar and storage. Making up the base load. The the term base load has got nothing to do with the generation. There is no such thing as a base load generator. You've got generators that like to run 24 7 because of their economics. You've got other generators that only like to run for a short percentage of the time. They're generally cheap but expensive to run. And then you've got you've got the variable inputs from wind and solar and storage that you can't dictate when they're going to deliver, but you can predict. One of my favorite predictions when people say you can't predict solar is to say try between nine o'clock at night and five in the morning to predict how much solar there will be. <laughs> and every time I've tried that, I've got it correct 100%. I've never been wrong. 
Unlike when I try to uh, run my nuclear 24-7 at night when I don't need it and I park it in my garage, in the morning I go there, I have to de-kind of gasify the garage for, uh, before I can get back into my car. So these things that are inflexible need to run all the time. It's not that helpful if your demand curve doesn't require it at that time. Okay, so I thought I'd put this together for you in a little video. And you'll notice that I'm saying that this can, and in my opinion should happen, in South Africa by 2030, not by 2040 or 2050. We can basically have a system in South Africa entirely renewable, entirely reliant, within 10 years, which would be a major country goal towards uh, our commitments to reductions in carbon emissions, and it would be cheaper, we would probably have to strand some of those assets, but if you speak to the manager who's just left Madupi, it wouldn't be a stranded asset of regret, it would be a stranded asset of pleasure, thank you, I'm off to Australia. So let's summarize that. We're replacing the coal fleet, we need to put in 30 gigs to replace the current 38. And that's because I've given it a capacity factor of 80% instead of 3%, not 3%, uh, 62%. Um, nuclear, we would have to put in 28 gigs, running at 90%. And you can see, remember, this is just to replace the coal fleet. We're not talking about increased demand for the future, but of course, if we increase the demand at all, we simply scale everything up. It's not an issue. Gas, we would put in 28. We would run it for about 76% of the time. Um, wind, if we did wind, 34 gigs of wind. That's three gigs of wind a year starting tomorrow to do it in the next 10 years. Capacity factor, 40%. Um, in South Africa, it's currently lower than that, but with the increased hub heights and increased rotor blade sizes with our wind resources, we can easily achieve 40% in many parts of the country. Solar PV, 50 um, gigs, that's about five gigs a year that I'm recommending. Capacity factors are 28.51, that's with single axis tracking. Uh, and then storage, at least 18 gigawatts, um, 72 gigawatts of storage. Um, so it's about, what would that be, about two gigawatts per year starting tomorrow. And that means that your system operator hasn't just got an overdraft, he's got an overdraft. He's got one of those black American Express cards that supposedly has no limit. We know some people who have those cards, but they also seem to have no limits. Okay, so the coal one, as I showed you, will cost us 1 Rand 36. This is a replacement fleet, not the current fleet. The nuclear would cost us about 189. This is not to mention the fact that these things would take between 5 and 10 years to put in place. And then we're in 2030 already. So it doesn't really help. The gas would cost us 133 if we did an all gas. And the wind solar storage, we have included gas in storage because I'm treating gas as a storage. I'm storing my gas and using it in bursts to make up shortfalls during days when there's little sunshine and no wind. And you'll see on an annual basis, you'll see what percentage of gas I need to use. So my calculations show we would need to use gas for about 7% of the total annual terawatt hours. I just want to thank, uh, uh, alert you again to CESA, the South African Energy Storage Association. Couldn't find a, a more reserved, uh, sorry, a nicer bunch of people to, to work with. Uh, sorry, reserved storage, it's, it's, it's all in there somewhere. Um, and you're going to be getting this presentation, so you'll find that there's a membership form if you want to enter or join the South African Energy Storage Association. Um, you, you've, when you go to the events, there's normally an excess. Um, uh, uh, and thank you very much.